so we'll get started with today's uh, lecture so the goal for today is to understand convergence of gradient descent methods And of course, uh, if you remember in the previous lecture, so let me just go back to the previous lecture. Uh, we had figured that this is the gradient descent algorithm and then there are many ways for picking DK. So you could have DK equals to identity, you could have DK equals to second derivative inverse, uh, that's Newton's method. And then there are approximate Newton's method uh, where DK was equal to the second derivative at X naught inverse and discretized Newton's method where DK is some approximation of second derivative inverse. And so we'll, in the, this will be studied under the topic of quasi Newton's method in a few class, maybe next week. And the two examples of quasi Newton's method are BFGS methods and DFP method. So these are the two methods that we will study. I mean, it's actually a family of algorithm, which we will study in the next class. And then we were talking about different ways of picking alpha k, which is the step size. So there is minimization rule, limited minimization rule, constant step size or Miho's rule and diminishing and tapering step size. So these are the five different ways of picking alpha k. And I had discussed the uh, definition of what it means for xk to be gradient related to dk. So now the first topic that I'm going to, like the first result that I'm going to talk about is as follows. So we have XK gradient related to DK. Oh, I, and I haven't written what DK is. So DK would be minus DK gradient of fxk, where dk is positive, capital dk is positive definite matrix. And if we pick alpha k, according to minimization rule, limited minimization rule, or Armijo's rule, then if xk converges to x bar, then x bar is a stationary point. So I'll pause here for a little bit. I want you to um, write this sentence or write this theorem in your notebook and think about it a little bit. Oh, I haven't, uh, maybe I have not defined what a stationary point is. So X bar is stationary if gradient of F X bar equal to zero, if and only if. So the idea here is uh, you want to make sure that your DK, uh, so gradient of FXK transpose DK should not vanish if uh, XK is converging to a non-stationary point. So that was the idea of, uh, uh, that was a definition of gradient related 
And if we pick alpha k according to minimization rule, limited minimization rule or Armijo's rule, then suppose the algorithm converges, converges, then the point at which the algorithm converges must be a stationary point. So of course you could have the algorithm non-convert, like it may not converge. So we don't want to consider those cases. We only want to consider cases where the algorithm converges, the gradient descent algorithm converges. In which case, what you're converging to is a stationary point, which means that you're converging to a point where the gradient vanishes. Now, what can we say about X bar? Is, would X bar be an optimal solution to the problem? Would it be a local minimum? Yes. Uh, Sorry. Sorry, but, but I, I heard two, two answers. So what were the answers? Uh, yes, because the x by, say, convex function. If it is convex, then it will be an optimal solution, sure. But right now, we are not making any convexity assumption on the function f. So what do you think? But gradient f of x is equal to zero, right? So it should be a convex function, uh, because it's a stationary point. Okay. Any other answer? Any other thoughts? I think it can be like stationary point, but not a local minimum. It can, it may not be a local minimum. Okay. Why would you say so? Because uh, like all, all we know is that just the gradient is, is zero, right? Right. I mean, that's the definition of stationary point. That's, that's the definition of stationary point, right? Yeah. But my question is whether it's a local minimum or not. We so can guarantee. I think we are not sure if it's a local minimum because we don't have, we don't have like nothing that say about like the sufficient condition. We have nothing about that. Right. Right. Okay. There was another opinion. What? Uh, yes. Uh, we may need to check the, whether it satisfies the sufficient conditions. Like right. Right. So. So. Um, so X bar is a stationary point. It may or may not satisfy the sufficient condition for optimality. So you still need to check to ensure, to ascertain that X bar is a local minimum. You need to check that second derivative of the function at x bar is strictly positive definite. Okay, so we need to check this sufficient condition. So sufficient condition says that if your gradient is zero and if your second derivative is positive definite, then x bar is guaranteed to be a local minimum. And so what we are saying here is that the gradient descent algorithm would converge to a stationary point but we don't know any information. We don't have any information about the curvature of uh, the function at X bar. And so the curvature information can only be gleaned if you know what the second derivative of the function is at X bar. And if it is positive definite, then you are guaranteed to be at local minimum. If it is not positive definite, then you can't say anything for certainty. Then it's just a candidate for an optimal solution, but it's not an optimal solution. Uh, now, of course, if your function f is convex, then stationary point, being stationary point is equivalent to being optimal, being globally optimal. So that way in the, in situations where f is convex, uh, you are, you have conversed to an optimal solution. So that's the best case scenario. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions on this yep. statement? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. No questions. So this is, uh, we are picking here alpha k according to minimization rule, limited minimization rule and Armijo's rule. So let me talk about constant step size. So constant step size. Gradient descent. So here alpha k are all same as alpha for all k in the space of natural numbers. So here again, I have to make some assumption. 
So XK is gradient related to DK. Um, of course, alpha K is constant, but I want alpha to be sufficiently small. If XK converges to X bar, then, oh, uh, I need to make another assumption, which is gradient of F is Lipschitz. What does this mean? Uh, this means if I take the norm of Fx minus Fy, uh, this is the two norm of the difference between the gradient of function at x and gradient of function at y, then this is less than equal to Lx minus y. L is the Lipschitz constant. I'm hoping you are familiar with the concept of Lipschitz continuity. Um, anyone who has not heard of Lipschitz continuity before? Yes. Okay. So, which means you have heard of it or you have not heard of it? <laughs> no, I haven't heard. You haven't heard of it, Lipschitz continuity. Okay. So, Lipschitz continuity just uh, means, so, where should I write it? Let me write it a little bit below. So, G, which is a function from Rn to Rm is Lipschitz continuous if and only if norm of gx minus norm of minus gy is less than equal to some constant L times x minus y. That's just the definition of Lipschitz continuity. So it's, it's stronger than continuity. Lipschitz continuity is stronger than the notion of continuity because um, you could have a function, well, let me just write an example. So this is X, this is square root of X, square root of X looks like this. And uh, this function is continuous, say between zero to infinity. So square root of X, is continuous, but not Lipschitz continuous. And one way to check that it's not Lipschitz continuous is to look at the derivative. And as you can see that the derivative around zero is unbounded, it's equal to infinity. So the derivative at zero is infinity. So, so therefore it's not Lipschitz continuous. Okay, so we are making a stronger assumption here that the derivative of the function f itself is Lipschitz continuous, okay? Um, and the conclusion here is, if xk converges to x bar, then gradient of fx bar equal to zero or x bar is stationary. Okay. So even in the case of constant step size, assuming that your function f is, has Lipschitz continuous uh, gradient, uh, you would converge eventually to a stationary point of the function f. 
Okay. Now let's see why we need the Lipschitz continuity with constant step size. It, it, so any questions so far on the statement of the theorem? In the plot for the Lipschitz constant, where you have the square root of x. Um, right. So you have g, of, yeah. g yeah. of x minus g of y. Uh, in this case, is our x and y both on the x-axis? Yes. So x and y, both of oh, them are okay. on the x-axis. Yes. So okay. y and rn. And of course, gx and gy, they are in rm because they were, th th those are in the range space of g, not in the domain. Okay. Yeah. And then is this Lipschitz constant that you have, the L, is yes. that an actual like number? Yeah, it will be an actual number. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other question? All right. So consider a function. So let's see what happens if the function f is not, it does not have a Lipschitz constant. So when it does not have a Lipschitz constant, it means that the uh, second derivative of the function can, in, can go all the way to infinity at some point, right? Um, well, so we, okay, let me, let me, uh, rewriting. So we want the gradient of F to be Lipschitz. Okay. So which means that the second derivative of F at X should be bounded for all X. So should be uniformly bounded for all X. I shouldn't say this implies, but uh, how should I say I mean, it, it works the other way. So this, if the second derivative is uniformly bounded, then it is Lipschitz continuous, but the other way doesn't hold. Um, so let's just consider this situation where the second derivative is uniformly bounded. Or we consider a situation where the second derivative is not uniformly bounded. So then the function may look something like this. So you see how the curvature here escapes to infinity very quickly. So the curvature is too high. And let's consider you are picking a constant step size algorithm. Then in some locations, so if you're here, when you pick a constant step size, you actually will take a very long step because the derivative is extremely high here. So gradient of F is very high. Okay, so you, with a constant step size, you're going to take a very long step. Okay, so you may, so this is of course a convex function. So I want to maybe draw a non-convex function. Okay, so your step size will be very long and therefore you might miss um, the minimum and you might go into a zigzag motion because your step sizes are sometimes extremely large and sometimes extremely small because the curvature, because the gradient of F is not Lipschitz continuous. On the other hand, when the gradient of F is Lipschitz continuous, then you will have a very smooth looking function. Even if it is non-convex, you will have a very smooth looking function. Okay. And the derivative is not going to go become very large very quickly. That's the meaning of having Lipschitz continuity. And so at every point X, your gradient of FX is reasonable and taking a step size, um, with using a constant step size will automatically adapt the length of the step you are taking depending on what the derivative of the function f looks like at that particular point. So this is alpha gradient of fx.
and so on. So that's why the constant, in, in order for constant step size to work, you want the derivative of the function to be Lipschitz continuous so that you're, you, you don't overshoot the minimum because of very steep curves, very steep slopes at certain points in the domain. Professor, uh, in both the examples, uh, yes. are, you, are you considering both the curves to be bounded or? No, the curve should not, it does not, it need not be bounded. Okay, let me give you another example. So the curve need not be bound, the derivative need not be bounded, but the rate of change of derivative needs to be bounded. You see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the rate has to be bounded, but not the derivative itself. So let me give you another example. Let's consider my function fx to be x transpose qx and Q is positive definite. Then the first derivative is actually QX, which can go to infinity if X is going to infinity, okay? But the second derivative of the function F, which is equal, sorry, 2Q, uh, the second derivative, which is equal to 2Q, this, if you, think of it, it, it is actually bounded because Q has some lambda max. And so this is always bounded by lambda max I. So lambda max of Q multiplied by I multiplied by two. Okay, so that way this has, this is a Lipschitz continuous. So F has Lipschitz continuous gradients. in this case. Okay. All right. So in this situation, in the case of constant step size, assuming you have Lipschitz continuous gradient, you still converge to a stationary point. Stationary point means nothing. Uh, you still have to check, check the second order sufficient condition to determine whether X bar is a local minimum or not. Okay. So these are some two broad results. You can have a similar result for, uh, for tapering step size or di diminishing step size as well. Uh, where you require some Lipschitz continuity on the function f and you need the gradient relatedness condition as well. And you can come up with a similar result. It's given in the book, but it's a very long result. So you can come up with some result like that even for diminishing step size um, uh, gradient descent algorithm. But some of the common theme across all these different proofs is that you want xk to be gradient related and in the case of constant step size and diminishing step size, you want the derivative of the function to be Lipschitz continuous. Um, in one of your assignments, I'll give you a example. Uh, I mean, I'll ask you to prove in one case where the gradient of F is not Lipschitz continuous and you will see that gradient descent algorithm would diverge for diminishing step size. So it's just a, a fun problem to work on and see how things blow up um, under certain conditions. If, if things seem, if your initialization is bad or if your step size selection is bad, your algorithm will blow up and then you choose your step size more conservatively, which means that you pick your step size very, very small and then suddenly you force convergence of the algorithm. So you will see both these situations in that assignment problem. So next I want to um, talk a little bit about the rate of convergence, which is actually a very important topic in today's world. Okay, so I don't want to say that F is, <clears throat> F is convex, but let's say X star is a local minimum. And 
And let's say your gradient descent is converging to X star. This is an assumption. Okay. Uh, one of the things you might ask is how quickly is XK converging to X star? Okay, so we understood in the previous two theorems that under some conditions, XK would converge to a stationary point eventually. Eventually means as K goes to infinity, you converge to some point. Now I'm asking a bit more complicated question. So I know you are converging to a stationary point or in this case, an optimal point, a local minimum. My question is slightly different. My question is how quickly are you converging? Are you converging in 10 steps? Are you converging in thousand steps? Are you converging in 1 billion steps? And as you can see, uh, when you are implementing these algorithms in real life, you would ideally like it to converge as soon as possible because you don't want to wait for five years to get to a local minimum. You probably want to get it within half an hour or within one hour or within three hours or five hours depending on the problem. And that is captured by the notion of rate of convergence of gradient descent algorithm. Okay, so how, how do you think you would measure how quickly XK is converging to X star? Any thoughts on, on that? How would you measure? So, so the question is clear. We want to understand how quickly XK is converging to X star. How would you measure it? What would be your metric? to understand if XK is converging fast or slow to X star. Possibly the number of iterations. To what? Or the number of updates that it takes. To get to X star? Yeah. yeah. So that will take infinite number of time steps. Always. You know, because these are iterative schemes and you can only get to the point eventually, but not within finite number of time steps in most situations. But that's a good first attempt. Can you please turn off your mic? Thank you. Okay, any thoughts? How would you measure whether XK is converging quickly to X star or not? Um, how fast the function of uh, the, like F of X uh, decreases. Okay, so that's good. So one idea is, I want to measure the updates in FXK minus FX star or how, how so the value of the gradient the value of the gradient okay so you want to check the norm of gradient of fxk and how it decreases so how quickly it goes to zero uh, we want to know how quickly this term goes to zero um, anything else how do you look at the ratio of consecutive functions evaluated at consecutive Perfect. points? Perfect. That was the actual answer I was looking for. So I want to understand fx0, let's say. So I want to understand how quickly uh, fxk plus 1 minus fx star over fx0 minus fx star, how quickly this is going to 0. Okay, so you could you could do it, you could measure it in two ways. One way to measure it is you want to measure this quantity. The other way to measure it is you want to measure this ratio. And both of them are completely fine. And depending on the application, one would be preferred over another. Uh, the third way to measure it is, you know, look at XK minus X star. So one of the person, one of your colleagues said that we should look at the number of time, number of K it takes to get to X star but that's a, not a good way to analyze it because it will take infinite number of steps to get to X star. 
So one way to understand how close it is to X star is just look at the distance between X K and X star. Okay, so these are different ways of measuring how quickly you are converging to X star. Okay. So, so let's look at some of the uh, examples. So, so let me say my EK is the error and it could be defined as either XK minus X star or it could be defined as FXK minus FX star depending on the application. So let's not worry about this right now, but I do know that in some applications, this may be preferred way of measuring the error or distance from the optimal solution. And you would ideally want to know, so EK converges linearly if EK is less than equal to Q beta raised to K. So Q is some constant, beta is in zero comma one. Okay, so then you say that the error is converging linearly. Uh, oh, let me write it as xk minus x star or fxk minus fx star is less than or equal to some q over k, where again q is greater than zero and of course k is the iteration number. So these are linear convergence regime. Then super linear. Actually, I'm not sure whether this should be K or K square. Okay, maybe, uh, I may be wrong here, I don't know. Uh, I'll confirm it in the next class. The superlinear convergence would be when your XK minus X star is less than or equal to Q beta raised to P raised to K, where P is greater than one, beta is in zero one, open interval zero one and Q is greater than zero. Okay, so this is uh, the error decays exponentially in the linear case. In the super linear case, the error decays higher than exponentially. So in this case, what you have is XK plus one minus X star xk minus x star raised to p, this goes to zero as k goes to infinity. <clears throat> okay, so these are definitions of uh, linear convergence and super linear convergence of the error. Any questions so far? So this is something I'll confirm in the next class. Okay. So let me give you some examples of convergence rate. So I'm not going to go into the proof because that will unnecessarily take a lot more time than what we have. So let's consider the case of steepest descent and the function fx that I'm considering is x transpose qx. Um, and of course, x star here is equal to zero. And f of x star here is also equal to zero. So in the steepest descent, the algorithm is xk plus one equals xk minus alpha k 
let me put a half here qk xk which is identity minus alpha k qk xk Any thoughts on how quickly this, so now this becomes a system of linear recursion. Uh, what do you think how quickly this is going to converge to zero? What would it depend on? Any thoughts on that? If alpha k multiplied by q is i, is the identity matrix? So this is identity matrix. This is alpha k is the step size. Qk is some positive definite matrix. So this is of the form that xk plus one equals to a xk, right? So, well, a k actually. Oh, there is no qk here. I'm so sorry. Q is constant. So alpha k is the only changing term here. Um, How quickly is this going to converge? Let me give you another hint. Okay, so let me pick alpha k equals to constant. Then xk plus one, it becomes i minus alpha q xk. So this is just a matrix A. So what did we learn in maybe lecture two or lecture three about convergence of recursions of this type? What does it depend on? Well, it actually depends on the eigenvalue, the maximum eigenvalue of A, okay? So that's what we, we discussed in the, I think second, towards the end of second class or third class. But this is the spectral radius, right? Yeah, the spectral radius of A, okay? okay. So how quickly it converges depends on the spectral radius of A. So it, you can show that if the smallest eigenvalue of Q is so this is the the highest eigenvalue of q this is the smallest eigenvalue of q okay so if this is satisfied and m is greater than zero capital m is of course greater than zero then one can show that steepest descent would converge for alpha k equals two over capital M plus M, this would imply that xk plus one minus x star over xk minus x star is less than equal to M minus M over M plus M. Okay, and you can achieve this equality by picking an appropriate value of x naught. Then you will, you will be, um, this bound will be tight. This upper bound is going to be tight. Okay, so this tells you, this would imply that xk plus one minus x star is less than equal to m minus m over m plus m raised to k x naught minus x star. Maybe it should be k plus one. Yeah, I think that makes sense. This is constant step size. Okay, so this converges linearly um, to the optimal solution. And you said M 
lower gate M and big case M are the smallest and largest eigenvalues? Yes, so this is this is the smallest eigenvalue. This is the largest eigenvalue. Well, I is identity, but this is the smallest eigenvalue of Q and capital M is the largest eigenvalue of Q. And I'm going to make the assumption that smallest eigenvalue is strictly positive. Okay, so now think about it. What happens if capital M is much, much greater than small m? What does it mean for m minus m over m plus m? What would this be approximately equal to? One. One. If m is very, very large, then this ratio is going to be very close to one. It's still going to be less than one, but it's going to be close to one, which means that the convergence is going to be very, very slow. Okay, so if M over capital M, which is known as the condition number, of Q is close to zero, then the convergence of steepest descent with constant step size is very slow. Okay, so this is known as condition number of Q. If the condition number of Q is close to zero, then the steepest descent with constant step size is very slow. Okay. I want to move to the next example. Again, I'm with steepest descent. with line minimization. Same objective function, everything remains the same. Um, in this case, in steepest descent with line minimization, I can show that my fxk plus one minus fx star over fxk minus fx star is less than equal to m minus m over m plus m whole square. Okay, again, this uh, inequality is tight. Okay, yeah, go ahead. K plus one minus fx, or is it uh, two norm? No, so this is fx k plus one minus fx star over fx k minus fx star. So this is different. So here, the criteria we are using for convergence is different from the criteria we are using here for convergence, okay? So like I mentioned at the very beginning of this particular uh, section of this lecture, uh, you can measure convergence or rate of convergence by either looking at fxk minus fx star or norm of xk minus x star. And this is also used sometimes, but we are not going to use it in our class. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other question? No? Okay, great. So in one case where steepest descent with constant step size, we were looking at the difference between XK and X star, and we showed that this relation, well, we didn't show it, but this relationship holds. Um, and in the case of steepest descent with line minimization, this particular relationship holds. Okay. Now let's say my F is convex. 
gradient F is Lipschitz. Alpha K is equal to alpha less than one over L. L is the Lipschitz coefficient of the gradient. Alpha is less than equal to one over L. So we are in a constant step size regime. Then it can be shown, all of these results are shown in some book or the other. Fxk minus Fx star, actually I don't need to put absolute value because Xk is gonna be greater than, Fxk is gonna be greater than Fx star is less than equal to X naught minus X star square. This is the two norm square over two alpha K. K is the iteration number, alpha is the step size. This is the initial error. And this is the convergence, uh, rate of convergence for the convex case where the, sec the first derivative of the function is Lipschitz. Okay, any questions so far on this one? All right, let's move on to the next result. So Newton's method. So Newton's method alpha k equals to one, x naught close to x star. Then it can be shown that x k plus one minus x star square, well, two norm over xk minus x star two norm limit k goes to infinity two norm square sorry um, this is close to zero I'm just going to check whether it's close to zero or is it converging to a constant? So I've written it in my notes that it goes to zero, but I have a hard time believing that that would be true. Oh, well, it's... Okay. So it's not going to go to zero but under certain assumptions, one can show that this is less than equal to uh, some constant C. C is some constant greater than zero. Okay, so under some assumptions. Okay, so this is known as superlinear convergence. Because 
what happens in Newton's method with uh, constant step size when x naught, the initial point you have picked is close to x star, is that it converges to x star very, very fast. So remember, this is xk minus x star square. So I want you to notice the square term here. So it's two norm square. And in the numerator, you have xk plus one minus x star. So if your xk minus x star was equals to say 0 0.9, then your xk plus 1 minus x star, assuming c is equal to 1, is going to be less than or equal to 0 0.81. Then it's going to be less than or equal to 0 0.64, something, something, and so on, right? So it's going to converge to 0 very, very fast. And that's so there was a question, I think, in the previous class or the class before, is Newton's method better than gradient descent or steepest descent? And this is the mathematical reasoning behind why it is better than steepest descent. It's because it has super linear convergence. Whereas, as we have seen in the steepest descent case, it has a linear convergence rate. So that's why Newton's method is better. But of course, it requires you to compute the second derivative inverse, which is uh, certainly problematic if your dimension of x is very, very large. And also you want the second derivative of f to be a positive definite in order to use Newton's method. So Professor, in this case, speed of convergence only focuses on the rate of superlinear convergence or linear convergence, but doesn't focus on the computation requirements depending on a particular case. Oh yes, absolutely. That's an extremely okay. good point, yes. So uh, there is something called computational complexity, which looks into how many additions, subtractions, multiplications, and so on is needed to go from x zero to x star, okay? And uh, this is not, telling us anything about how many subtractions, multiplication, matrix inverses, and so on is needed to get to X star. Um, so that is com 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 computational complexity. That's what deals, so that's the field that deals with exact number of, um, you know, multiplications that are needed or addition subtractions that are needed. And when you are implementing things on computer, you have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, the runtime of an algorithm is largely dependent on how many multiplications and matrix inverses you need to take during the run of an algorithm. So this is purely saying how many iterations you have run. Now, it could be that one iteration of Newton's method can take one second, whereas a gradient descent will take only one millisecond. And you may have to trade off based on your experience and knowledge whether Newton's method is the best algorithm or gradient descent is the best algorithm uh, for the particular application that you are looking at. Any so other question? Yeah. Uh, I have a doubt regarding the Newton's method initial assumptions that we have taken. Right. Uh, why we have taken X naught close to X optimal? Great. We can take it in steepest descent. Right. So, um, you know, when you are proving a theorem, that's also an excellent question. When you are proving a theorem, the theorem has to be general enough, okay? So, so here is my X star. Let's say I pick my X naught, which is far from X star. I'm not very sure what kind of curvature the function has in this, this region to say anything intelligent about what should be the step size selection and so on and so forth. Um, in the case of quadratic function, you know the curvature is the same everywhere. So if your function is x transpose qx, then the curvature is same no matter whether you are here or whether you are here. And so the results can be said more globally because the curvature is known globally, okay? But in the more general cases, what you want to, you want to say something which is general. So you kind of restrict your attention in some ball around x star and you give a local result with the hope that the local result will actually extend globally, 
by some trick for instance you can make your step size small when you are far away from x not from far away from x star and then once you are close to x star you can start picking a higher value of step size um and and converts to x star very very quickly okay does that make sense so it's more of a mathematical when you want to prove theorem you want to be as general as possible and sometimes you can prove a general theorem locally but you can't prove it globally so is it like uh... this assumption is like a restriction or limitation of, on the newton's method like we need to be close enough to no no so let's say you are let's say your you picked your x not and you don't know whether x not is far away from x star or not so then you will pick your alpha k to be equals to 0.001 and you will run newton's method for 1000 iterations and then after a thousand iteration you will pick alpha k equals to 0.1 and you will run for another say 500 iterations and then you pick alpha k equals to 1 for another for subsequent num whatever number of iterations you want to run okay so it's so even though you have proved the result for alpha k equals to 1 and x not close to x star um when you are actually implementing it you don't know whether your x not is close to x star or not so you try to be conservative and you pick your alpha k very very small and you you know slowly increase your alpha k in order to get to the solution faster but also maintain numerical stability does that help you uh, yes professor yeah. thank you okay any other question all right so i'll be available for office hours in 15 minutes so i'll see you guys in 15 minutes and meanwhile i'll download this video and upload it on youtube uh thanks for your attention i'll see you guys in next class if you're not joining my office hours